CSE Volume 2, Chapter 16, The Portfolio Management Process. Chapter Overview. In the previous chapter, you learned about the basic skills of investment management using a portfolio approach. In this chapter, you will learn to apply those skills within a seven-step portfolio management process. The main content areas are Step 1, Determine Investment Objectives and Constraints. Step 2, Design an Investment Policy Statement. Step 3, Develop the Asset Mix. Step 4, Select the Securities. Step 5, Monitor the Client, the Market, and the Economy. Step 6, Evaluate Portfolio Performance. And Step 7, Rebalance the Portfolio. Introduction Portfolio management is a continual process because financial markets and individual circumstances are ever-changing. Advisors must therefore be flexible to adapt to change. As we have seen before, there is no one-size-fits-all solution to investing, and finding the right fit is critical to achieving financial objectives. Portfolio management requires analyzing a great deal of personal and financial information about your clients to determine an asset mix that best suits them. A portfolio is never made up of one security, rather it is a mix of a variety of securities that add up to something that is or should be more than the sum of its individual parts. The asset mix can be allocated between cash, fixed income securities, and equities in any number of ways. It is often quoted that the asset allocation decision has a significant impact on the overall return of a portfolio. Asset allocation means the proportion of a portfolio invested in each asset class. Consequently, it is crucial that you understand what is involved in the decision-making process. When working with clients as an advisor, you must be able to explain the asset choices you make. You must also be prepared to react to changing markets, investor objectives, and economic factors. In this chapter, we discuss some of the key industry theories, practices, and measurements that are a standard procedure in the process of managing investment portfolios. The Portfolio Management Process Although securities are sometimes selected on their own merits, portfolio management stresses the selection of securities based on their interaction with each other and their contribution to the portfolio as a whole. This process is known as the portfolio approach. The return of the portfolio is the weighted average of the returns of each security, but the risk of a portfolio is almost always less than the risks of the individual securities within it. Interaction among the securities results in the total portfolio effect being more than the sum of its parts. This improved risk-reward trade-off is a benefit of the portfolio approach compared to making uncoordinated decisions. The portfolio management process consists of the following seven basic steps. Determine investment objectives and constraints. Design an investment policy statement. Develop the asset mix. Select the securities. Monitor the client, the market, and the economy. Evaluate portfolio performance. And rebalance the portfolio. The portfolio management process is a continuous cycle as shown in figure 16.1. Your client's investment objectives and constraints will change throughout their lives. Therefore, you must reevaluate them periodically. Step 1. Determine investment objectives and constraints. To determine the appropriate asset allocation for a particular portfolio, you must first determine the client's investment objectives and constraints. Clients usually do not communicate their primary investment goals in terms of risk and return. Goals might be stated, for example, as a desire to retire at a certain age, a plan to acquire a business, vacation property, or sailboat, or the pursuit of some other tangible goal. With the right approach, and with the client's full agreement and understanding, you can help translate such desires into realistic investment objectives that recognize the client's particular constraints. Pointed interview questions about related objectives and constraints can reveal a great deal of information. You can also learn a lot from a concluding general question. For example, you might ask, is there anything we haven't talked about that might be relevant? Such questions can reveal important things you may have missed, such as the following pertinent facts. A family member who is an insider, which represents a legal constraint. A serious illness, which has income and time horizon implications. A pending marital breakup, which can have a material impact on future plans. Investment objectives. In general, an investor's objectives comprise the following three primary investment components. Safety of principal, also called preservation of capital, income, and growth of capital. Secondary investment objectives include liquidity or marketability and tax minimization. As an advisor, you should explain each objective to your client and jointly determine the appropriate balance among all objectives. Allocation to each primary objective on a percentage basis is recommended. 
This approach adds clarity for both parties, especially when clients have trouble communicating their wishes. Clarity of objectives also translates well into the categories of the account application. Below are descriptions of the three types of primary objectives which were noted above. Safety of principle. Many clients want some assurance that their initial capital invested will largely remain intact. If this is your client's main concern among the three primary objectives, you should help to prevent erosion of the amount initially invested, regardless of the return generated on the capital. However, if safety of principle is the main concern, the client must accept a lower rate of income return and give up much of the opportunity for capital growth. In Canada, a high degree of safety of principle and certainty of income is offered by most federal, provincial, and municipal bonds if they are held to maturity. Shorter term bonds also offer a high degree of safety because they are close to their maturity dates. A Government of Canada Treasury Bill, or T-Bill, offers the highest degree of safety. It is virtually risk-free. Income Income from a portfolio is a regular series of cash flows received from debt and equity securities, whether as dividends, interest, or other form. In determining the income objective and the split between debt and equity securities, major considerations are taxation of dividends and interest income. This decision is made at the time the asset mix is set. To maximize the rate of income return, investors usually give up some safety if they purchase corporate bonds or preferred shares with lower investment ratings. In general, safety goes down as yield goes up. Growth Growth of capital, or capital gains, refers to the profit generated when securities are sold for more than they originally cost to buy. When capital gains are the primary investment objective, the emphasis is on security selection and market timing. Note that capital gains are taxed more favorably than interest income. However, taxation details are more fully discussed in the Canadian taxation chapter. Here's an example. Applying the three primary objectives to different types of investors might include, for safety of principle, a young couple invests their savings for the eventual purchase of a house. A business executive temporarily invests funds that will be used to buy out a business partner six months later. For income, a single parent earning a salary relies on additional income from investments to meet the cost of raising and educating a child. A retired couple's pension income is insufficient to provide for all living expenses. For growth, a well-paid young executive with excess income wishes to build a pool of capital for early retirement. A vice president of a corporation seeks above average returns through common share investments. Table 16.1 shows in broad terms the four major kinds of securities and evaluates them in terms of the three primary investment objectives. Note, for our purposes, the evaluation in the table disregards the effects of inflation. First up, we have short-term bonds. They are the best for safety. For income, they are very steady, but for growth, they are very limited. For long-term bonds, for safety, they are next best. For income, they are very steady. And for growth, they are variable. For preferred shares, for safety, they are good. For income, they are steady. But for growth, they are variable. For common shares, for safety, they are the least safe. For income, they are variable. And for growth, they have the most. Generally, clients have secondary objectives in addition to the three primary objectives discussed above. Typical secondary objectives include liquidity and tax avoidance, which are detailed below. Liquidity. Liquidity is not necessarily related to safety, income return, or capital gain. It simply means that at nearly all times, there are buyers at some price level for the securities, usually at a small discount from fair value. Liquidity is important for investors who may need money on short notice. For others, it may not be vital. Most Canadian securities can be sold quickly in reasonable quantities at some price. Typically, they sell within one business day with settlement to follow within two business days. Some real estate-related securities are an exception. Tax avoidance. When assessing the returns from any investment, you must consider the effect of taxation. The tax treatment of an investment varies depending on whether the returns are categorized as interest, dividends, or capital gains. Therefore, tax treatment of the returns influences the choice of investments. Return and risk objectives. All information learned from the client through interviews, questionnaires, and follow-up discussions should be distilled into a return objective and a risk objective. These objectives must address two questions. What rate of return does the client need to attain the stated goals? What risk is the client willing and able to take on to achieve those goals? The return objective is a measure of how much a client's portfolio is expected to earn each year on average. 
This objective depends primarily on the return required to meet the client's goals, but it also must be consistent with the client's profile. The client interview should help reveal the preferred result, whether it is maximum return or minimum loss. In the first case, your strategy should be to focus on earning the highest return possible while adhering to the client's risk profile. In the second case, you should focus on risk reduction. In addition, the investment policy should be designed to take into account the client's tax position and needs with respect to the proportion of interest income, capital gains, and dividend income to be generated. The risk objective is a specific statement of how much risk the client is willing to sustain to meet the return objective. The risk objective is based on the client's willingness and ability to bear risk. Assessment of the client's risk profile is a vital element in the ultimate design of the portfolio because it governs the selection of securities. Inflation is one consideration in determining a client's risk profile. Most retail clients need some degree of inflation protection, but the extent of the need varies. For example, consider a retired person with a long time horizon and income as the primary objective. The future purchasing power of the cash flow from this client's portfolio is an important concern. Therefore, protection from inflation is essential. Did you know? Because the risk of a portfolio is usually less than the average risk of its holdings, a client's risk profile should be matched to the risk of the overall portfolio, rather than the risk of each security. Table 16.2 shows some alternatives available when constructing a portfolio. For cash and cash equivalents, we have government issues less than a year. This is the lowest risk and highest quality. And corporate issues less than a year. This is the highest risk and lowest quality. For fixed income securities, we have short term, which is one to five years, and this is low risk, low price volatility. We have medium term, five to 10 years. This is medium risk and medium price volatility. And long term, over 10 years, this is high risk and maximum price volatility. For the asset class of equities, we have firstly conservative, which is low risk, high capitalization, predictable earnings, high yield, high dividend payouts, lower price to earnings ratio, and low price volatility. Next, we have growth equities, which is medium risk, average capitalization, potential for above average growth in earnings, aggressive management, lower dividend payout, higher price to earnings ratio, and potentially higher price volatility. For venture equities, they are high risk, low capitalization, limited earnings record, no dividends, price to earnings ratio of little significance, short operating history, and highly volatile. For speculative equities, they are maximum risk, shorter term, maximum price volatility, no earnings, no dividends, price to earnings ratio not significant. As table 16.2 shows, equities are grouped by level of risk. Risk assessment is a subjective process, but the four categories provide a basis for risk differentiation. The differences between the categories are largely a function of differences in capitalization, earnings performance, predictability of earnings, liquidity, and potential price volatility. Because these variables apply to all common shares in all industry groups, each industry may have companies whose securities could be ranked in any of the four groups. Also, because companies are not static, the risk in an individual security can change over time and may warrant a shift to a higher or lower rating. Also, because companies are not static, the risk in an individual security can change over time and may warrant a shift to a higher or lower ranking. Investment Constraints Investment constraints impose necessary discipline on clients in the fulfillment of their objectives. Constraints may loosely be defined as those items that may hinder or prevent you from satisfying your client's objectives. Constraints are often not given the importance they deserve in the policy formation process. Typical constraints include a variety of issues, including the factors described below. Time horizon. A major factor in the design of a good portfolio is how well it reflects the time horizon of its goals. Fundamentally, the time horizon is the period spanning the present until the next major change in the client's circumstances. Clients go through various events in their lives, each of which can represent a time horizon and a need to completely reevaluate their portfolio. Some major events, such as a serious health problem or loss of employment, cannot be predicted. Nevertheless, a client's time horizon should extend from the present until the next major expected change in circumstances. For example, a 25-year-old client who plans to retire at age 60 will not likely have a single time horizon of 35 years. Various events in the client's life will end one time horizon and begin a new one. Events might include finishing university, making a career change, planning for the birth of a child, or purchasing a home. 
Liquidity Requirements In portfolio management, liquidity refers to the amount of cash and near cash in the portfolio. The cash component could be higher during certain parts of the market cycle. For example, it could go up when securities are judged to be overpriced or when the yield curve is inverted and the returns on cash are high. Tax Requirements Your client's marginal tax rate dictates, in part, the proportion of income that the client should receive as interest income in relation to dividends. Dividends from the Canadian corporations are eligible for a tax credit. The subject of the dividend tax credit is discussed in Chapter 24. The marginal tax rate also guides the proportion that should be invested in preferred shares versus other fixed income securities such as bonds. High tax rates can significantly erode the final return on more traditional investments such as guaranteed investment certificates. Legal and Regulatory Requirements Any investment activity that contravenes an act, law, bylaw, regulation, or rule must be considered a constraint. For example, a client who is an insider or owner of a control position at a publicly traded company must comply with all applicable regulatory guidelines. All firms have compliance personnel and many have legal counsel on staff. You should consult these resources when you have any questions about legal issues. Unique Circumstances when creating the investment policy, you must consider the unique circumstances specific to your client. Unique circumstances may include such preferences as the desire for ethically and socially responsible investing. For example, some clients may instruct you to ensure that no alcohol or tobacco stocks are purchased to respect their personal convictions. Step 2. Design an Investment Policy Statement an investment policy statement is an agreement between a portfolio manager and a client that provides the investment guidelines for the manager. The investment policy statement outlines how the assets within the portfolio are to be managed. Though there is no standardized list of components to include in an investment policy statement, some important considerations are listed below. Operating rules and guidelines. Asset allocation. Investment objectives and constraints. A list of acceptable and prohibited investments. The method used for performance appraisal agreed to by the advisor and the client. Schedule for portfolio reviews. The statement can be a lengthy written and signed document or it can be derived from the account application in accordance with the Know Your Client rule. Regardless of its level of formality, the investment policy is the result of many complex inputs. Step 3. Develop the asset mix. After designing the investment policy based on the client's investment objectives and constraints, the portfolio manager must select appropriate investments for the portfolio. If it is your role to select the asset mix, it is critical that you understand the relationship between the equity cycle and the economic cycle. You must use this understanding to plan the weighting of each asset class. You must also consider the individual characteristics and risk profile of the client. The asset mix. The main asset classes are cash, fixed income securities, and equity securities. More sophisticated portfolios may also include alternative investments such as private equity capital funds, currency funds, or hedge funds. Cash. Cash and cash equivalents includes currency, money market securities, redeemable GICs, bonds with a maturity of one year or less, and all other cash equivalents. Cash is needed to pay for expenses and to capitalize on opportunities, but is primarily used as a source of liquid funds in case of emergencies. In general terms, Cash usually makes up at least 5% of a diversified portfolio's asset mix. Investors who are very risk averse may hold as much as 10% in cash. Cash levels may temporarily rise greatly above these amounts during certain market periods or during portfolio rebalancing. However, normal long-term strategic asset allocations for cash are within 5% and 10%. Fixed Income Securities Fixed income securities consists of bonds due in more than one year, strip bonds, mortgage-backed securities, fixed income exchange-traded funds, bond mutual funds, and other debt instruments, as well as preferred shares. The purpose of including fixed income products is primarily to produce income, but also to provide some safety of principle. They are also sometimes purchased to generate capital gains. From a portfolio management standpoint, preferred shares are simply another type of fixed income security. They have a stated level of income, trade on a yield basis, are subject to the same protective provisions, and have a reasonably definable term. Legally, preferred shares are an equity security. However, they are listed in portfolios as part of the fixed income component because of their price action and cash flow characteristics. You can diversify this part of the asset mix in several ways, including the following methods. Both government and corporate bonds can be used in a range of credit qualities, from AAA to lower grades. 
Foreign bonds may be added to domestic holdings. A variety of terms to maturity are often used. Example, in a concept called laddering, the various consecutive durations mimic rungs on a ladder. Deep discount or strip bonds can be chosen alongside high coupon bonds. The amount of a portfolio allocated to fixed income securities is governed by the following factors. The need for income over capital gains, the basic minimum income required, the desire for preservation of capital, and other factors such as tax and time horizon. Equity securities. Equities include common shares, equity exchange traded funds, equity mutual funds, and both convertible bonds and convertible preferred shares. Although a dividend stream may flow from the equity section of a portfolio, its main purpose is to generate capital gains either through trading or long-term growth in value. Did you know? If the conversion privilege expires on a convertible security and the security is therefore no longer convertible, it should be recategorized as a fixed income. Other asset classes. Although portfolios of most retail clients consist of cash, fixed income, and equities, investors can diversify further by adding the following types of investments, which fall outside of the major asset classes. Collectibles, such as art or coins. Commodities, such as gold, which is considered a good hedge against inflation. Derivatives, hedge funds, precious metals, and real estate. Setting the asset mix. The phases of the equity cycle trace movements in the stock market, which include expansion, peak, contraction, trough, and recovery. A study of the equity cycle is a useful approach for a general understanding of stock market movements. Figure 16.2 shows the S&P TSX Composite Index over the last few decades and illustrates, with shading, the different phases. It is important to note that within a stock market expansion phase, which may last several years, there are also serious setbacks or corrections to stock prices, which may last as long as a year. Asset Class Timing the rationale behind asset class timing is that investors can improve returns by strategically switching from stocks to T-bills to bonds and back to stocks. The benefits of successful timing are undeniable, however investors do not always have the analytical tools available that tell them when to shift between asset classes. In reality, most investors are unable to determine whether a rise in interest rates is designed to slow economic growth or whether it is pointing to a coming contraction or recession. Another consideration in asset class timing is term to maturity. If at the time in question, bonds are the best asset class, then it should make sense to lengthen the term of bond holdings to maximize returns. Similarly, if stocks are the best asset class, then certain strategies can be implemented to maximize stock market gains. It is generally accepted that asset allocation has an important impact on the variation in the total returns of investment portfolios. The link between equity and economic cycles. To understand stock market strategies, you must also understand the link between equity cycles and economic cycles. In general, the cycles are very similar except that the equity cycle tends to lead. Figure 16.3 shows that the sustained economic growth in nominal gross domestic product, beginning in 1982 and 1996, fits closely with the generally sustained rise in stock prices over that time. You should note that the beginning of the equity cycle preceded the beginning of the economic cycle by several months during 1982 and 1983, and also during 1996 and 1997. The equity cycle also preceded the beginning of the economic cycle in 2009, which further underscores the Toronto Stock Exchange's role as a leading indicator. It is also important to note that the annual chart reflects the impact of the worldwide pandemic that affected Canadian and other economies around the world starting in the first quarter of 2020. For investors who understand the relationship between economic and equity cycles, it is possible to follow the general investment strategies outlined in Table 16.3. So first up, we have the contraction phase of the equity cycle. And for the business cycle, this is explained as the end of expansion through peak into the contraction phase. Recession conditions are apparent and interest rates are high. The strategy for this phase, lengthen term of bond holdings by selling short-term bonds and buying mid-term to long-term bonds. Try to maintain same yield or income. Avoid or reduce stock exposure. Moving on to the stock market trough. For the business cycle, this is late contraction phase to end of contraction phase. The bottom of the business cycle has not been reached, but the stock market has begun to advance because of falling interest rates and the expectations of an economic recovery. The strategy here, sell long-term bonds because they rallied ahead of stocks in response to falling interest rates. Common stocks usually rally dramatically, Often, the largest gains occur in the higher-risk cyclical industries. For the recovery and expansion phase of the equity cycle, the business cycle is the end of trough into recovery and expansion phase. The bottom of the business cycle has been reached. 
economy starts growing again, unemployment is falling, and businesses are making profits. The strategy here, increase common stock exposure given that sustained economic growth generally allows stocks to do well. Now for our equity cycle peak, for the business cycle this is late expansion into peak phase. Economic growth has been sustained, however this has also led to higher interest rates and the Bank of Canada may be tightening its monetary policy. Short term interest rates tend to be higher than long term rates, in other words the yield curve is inverted. The strategy here, reduce common stock exposure and invest in short term interest bearing paper. The equity cycle peak is generally followed by the contraction phase. The problem with these general strategies is that they do not account for the many important variations that occur during an equity cycle. These variations may dramatically affect stock and bond market performance for 12 months or longer. Here's an example. During the expansion phase of 1982 to 1989, the stock market experienced sharp declines due to high interest rates for 6 months in 1984 and during the stock market crash of 1987. Although the general strategies appear attractive, variations within a cycle can affect asset class performance. Changes in the S&P TSX Composite Index price generally result from changes in interest rates or economic growth. The relationships between interest rate trends and economic trends, and therefore corporate profit trends, are of the greatest significance to equity price levels. These two factors, in combination, generally account for a high percentage of the change in stock market prices. As a result, these factors are often used together in asset mix models. Interest rates are used by central banks as a policy tool for managing economic growth, therefore changes in rates tend to lead to changes in economic growth. Asset Allocation Asset allocation requires a determination of the optimal division of an investor's portfolio among the different asset classes. For example, based on the client's tolerance for risk and investment objectives, the portfolio may be divided as follows, 10% in cash, 30% in fixed income securities, and 60% in equities. Portfolio managers and investors may also alter asset allocation to take advantage of changes in the economic environment. For example, when the economy enters a period of rapid growth, you must decide how best to take advantage of the market to manage a portfolio. You may find that a heavier weighting in equities will generate better returns than holding more of the portfolio in fixed income securities or cash. Alternatively, if you determine that the economy is likely to enter a recession, a heavier weighting in cash or fixed income securities may generate higher returns. This process of altering a portfolio's asset allocation to take advantage of changes in the economy is one meaning of the term market timing. The importance of asset allocation. Portfolio managers generate investment returns through the following four means. Choice of an asset mix, market timing decisions, security selection, and chance. Asset allocation is the single most important step in structuring a portfolio. An asset allocation strategy is usually specified in the investment policy statement. Although investment advisors may have the freedom to recommend an array of individual securities subject to any investment restrictions, the overall portfolio of a client's portfolio invested in cash, debt securities, and equity securities may be fixed. Decisions regarding asset allocation depend on the client's investment objectives and constraints, as well as the returns available from capital markets. Table 16.4 demonstrates the importance of the asset mix in determining overall portfolio returns. In the first part of Table 16.4, the annual return by asset class, Portfolio Manager X outperforms Portfolio Manager Y by 22% in cash, 100% in fixed income securities, and 50% in equities. However, the second part, which is the actual asset mix, highlights the actual allocation of assets in each portfolio. Clearly, Portfolio Manager X invested more heavily in fixed income securities, whereas Portfolio Manager Y emphasized equities. The third part, which is the total return on a $1,000 portfolio, shows the total return realized by each portfolio manager in a $1,000 portfolio. Note that total return is calculated by multiplying the amount invested in each asset group by the rate of return for that group and adding the results. Even though Manager X significantly outperformed Manager Y in each asset class, Manager Y's asset mix decisions resulted in the portfolio achieving a higher total return. The conclusion is clear. When seeking to maximize the total return of a balanced portfolio, it is more important to focus on getting the asset group right than to outperform an index or market average within an asset group. This principle is particularly true when capital markets are volatile. Balancing the asset classes. The next step in the asset allocation process is to determine the appropriate balance among the selected asset classes by investigating the client's full circumstances to determine an appropriate asset mix. 
The asset allocations, shown in Table 16.5, use cash, fixed income, and equity asset classes to make up suitable portfolios for three different clients. These particular allocations should serve as examples only. They should not be mistaken for templates. Each client's situation is unique. So our first client is a young, healthy, single professional with good investment knowledge, high willingness to accept risk, moderate tax rate, and a long time horizon. They are 5% cash, 25% fixed income, and 70% equities. Our second client is a senior citizen in a low tax bracket with no income other than government pensions, a medium time horizon, and low ability to endure a potential financial loss. Their cash is 8%, fixed income 67%, and equities 25%. Our third client is a middle-aged line factory worker, married with three teenage children, homeowner with limited investment knowledge, whose main concerns are employment security and college education funding. Their cash is 10%, fixed income 40%, and equities 50%. Strategic Asset Allocation Investment management firms, both large and small, often have proprietary, highly sophisticated models to forecast security prices. For the purposes of this course, we show how asset allocation is determined through historical results, as shown in Table 16.6. Considering only equities and fixed income, and with 10% increments in the asset mix, the following are the expected returns for the various asset mixes. Table 16.6 above illustrates an analysis that considers equities to fixed income in various combinations. 0% equities to 100% fixed income, 10% equities to 90% fixed income, 20% equities to 80% fixed income, and so on, to 100% equities to 0% fixed income. The expected return of each asset mix combination is calculated by the manager. After viewing the possibilities outlined above and considering the relative riskiness of stocks versus bonds, the manager will choose the optimal combination in consultation with the client. The asset mix is usually expressed in terms of percentage holdings, such as 60 to 40 equities to fixed income mix in which case the portfolio will have an expected return of 7.76%. This base policy mix is called the strategic asset allocation, which is the long-term mix that the manager will adhere to through monitoring and, when necessary, rebalancing. As shown in Table 16.6 above, a limited number of asset mixes are analyzed to determine the expected return of each combination. In consultation with the client, the manager then reviews the range of outcomes and chooses the most desirable allocation. This strategic allocation determines the long-term policy asset mix. Suppose a $100,000 portfolio is invested $60,000 in equities and $40,000 in fixed income for a 60 to 40 asset mix. If the stock market rose 10% while the bond market sagged 10%, the investor's portfolio mix would be higher than 60% equities and lower than 40% fixed income after the change in market values. This is shown in Table 16.7 where equities have gone from 60,000 to 66,000 and fixed income has lowered from 40,000 down to 36,000. Ongoing asset allocation. After the asset mix is implemented, the asset classes will change in value along with fluctuations in the market and dividends and interest income will flow into the cash component. As a result, the asset mix will also change. Here's an example. A portfolio starting out with an asset mix of 10% cash, 40% fixed income, and 50% equities could see its cash increase to 15% through cash flows from interest, dividends, and maturing bonds, and the equity component could rise to 55% through rising stock values. The fixed income class might be higher in value than before, but proportionately, however, it would nevertheless be underweighted at only 30% of the total portfolio value. This drift calls for a rebalancing back to the original policy mix of 10% to 40% to 50%. With this strategy, you should rebalance in a disciplined manner. You should act before the mix gets too far out of balance while remaining conscious of transaction costs. You would typically specify that an asset class must move more than a certain percentage, perhaps 5%, before rebalancing. Dynamic Asset Allocation Portfolio rebalancing, also known as dynamic asset allocation, is a portfolio management technique that adjusts the asset mix to systemically rebalance the portfolio back to its long-term target or strategic asset mix. Rebalancing may be necessary in the following situations. There is a buildup of idle cash reserves, possibly from dividends or interest income cash flows that have not been reinvested. There are movements in the capital markets causing abnormal returns, such as happened during the 1987 market crash the 1998 Asian financial crisis, or the 2008-2009 global financial crisis. 
The portfolio manager follows a policy that places a limit on the degree to which each asset category can drift above or below the long-term target mix. Rebalancing becomes necessary once an asset category moves above or below this range. For example, the policy may call for rebalancing if equities rise by more than 5% above their target weighting. A dynamic rebalancing approach is demonstrated in Table 16.8. The strong performance in the stock market has altered the target asset mix to 64.7% equities and 35.3% fixed income. One method of rebalancing the portfolio back to its target mix is the direct buying and selling of the securities in the portfolio. The table demonstrates the approach needed to restore the target mix as follows. Sell $4,800 worth of equities and buy $4,800 worth of fixed income. Using the dynamic approach, Rebalancing dampens returns in a strong market because the portfolio manager is reducing the strongest performing component. On the other hand, it enhances returns in a weak market period because the manager purchases underperforming asset classes at reduced prices. The dynamic strategy is suitable for a more risk-adverse investor, such as a retired individual with a low risk profile. The tax situation of the investor should be reviewed carefully because active management will result in more realized capital gains and losses. Tactical Asset Allocation The investment policy statement may indicate a particular long-run balance of equities to fixed income, but this strategic asset allocation need not be rigid. The statement may also allow for some short-term tactical deviations from the strategic mix. This strategy, called Tactical Asset Allocation, allows you to capitalize on investment opportunities in one asset class before reverting to the long-term strategic asset allocation. Did you know? The strategic allocation is considered the long-term strategy, whereas tactical deviations are short-term strategies. Here's an example. If the bond market is depressed and poised for an upswing, you might overweight the portfolio in fixed income products well over the strategic asset allocation for fixed income. After a few weeks or months, having profited from this move, you would then move back to the long-term strategic asset allocation. In this way, you can exercise your market timing skills while investing for the expected return indicated by the strategic mix. Though not a passive strategy, this approach is only moderately active and is appropriate for the long-term investor who is interested in market timing. Moving on to step 4. Select the securities. Many investors and advisors mistake security selection for investment management. Selecting securities without following the other steps in the investment management process is meaningless. Still, the investment management process is pointless without the execution of a plan, thus security selection is the pivotal step in the process. Very simply, security selection is the step in which specific securities, like stocks, bonds, or managed products, or any other investment vehicle, are chosen for inclusion in a client's portfolio. Selection stems from the equity and fixed income analysis which are covered in other chapters of this course. Step 5. Monitor the client, the market, and the economy. Constructing a portfolio is only the beginning of an ongoing management process. Having set the investment policy and having designed and implemented an asset mix, the next step is to monitor the portfolio. It is essential, therefore, that you develop a system to monitor the appropriateness of the securities that comprise the portfolio and the strategies that govern it. The monitoring process involves three key areas of focus. Changes in the investor's goals, financial position, and preferences expectations for individual securities and capital markets, industry trends, and the overall economic climate. Monitoring the client. It is critical that you stay informed about your client's objectives and that you update the client profile regularly. The account application sets out the original profile of income, assets, investment knowledge, and goals. You must monitor the client for changes in these areas. As well, you must monitor the client for changes in tolerance for risk, need for liquidity, need for savings, and tax brackets. If any significant changes occur, you should complete an amended account application. Monitoring Markets Capital markets evolve constantly to reflect changes in government and central bank policies, economic growth or recession, and sectoral shifts in prosperity within the economy. You must constantly be aware of the direction of monetary policy, forecasts for gross domestic product and the inflation rate, shifts in consumer demand and capital spending, and the potential impact of all these factors on the strategic asset mix or on individual holdings. Your challenge is to anticipate change and systematically adjust the portfolio to reflect both return expectations and the objectives of the client. In adjusting a portfolio, you should follow the same methodology you used when constructing it. 
Monitoring the economy. The asset mix decision is complex because it involves an analysis of all capital markets. The decision-making process should incorporate virtually all information that may affect each asset class. The scope of this material includes expected activities in the private and public sectors, both nationally and internationally, government policies, corporate earnings, economic analysis, existing market conditions, and the forecaster's interpretation of the data. Because of the complexity of the data and the subjectivity in interpretation, it is very difficult to make an accurate prediction about the magnitude of change in a particular asset class. Therefore, forecasts are sometimes expressed in ranges with a minimum and maximum level. This method reflects the unpredictability of capital markets and indicates the degree of risk anticipated. The expected total returns for each asset group are calculated by adding the expected annual income to the expected capital gain or loss for each group. Here's an example. If stock prices are expected to increase 10% and dividend yields are forecasted to be 4%, then the expected total pre-tax return for equities would be 14%. Step six, evaluate portfolio performance. The success of a portfolio is determined by comparing the total rate of return of the portfolio under evaluation with the average total return of comparable portfolios. In this way, you and your client can compare the client's returns to industry norms and estimate your approximate ranking in relation to the returns of other portfolio managers. You can estimate the ranking of most individual investors most easily by comparing their performance with the averages shown in one of the surveys of funds appearing regularly in financial publications. Because many different funds are measured in the surveys, you can compare both the total returns and the component returns of the client's portfolio. For example, the equity component of a diversified portfolio can be compared with the equity funds shown. Advisors are often measured against a predetermined benchmark that was specified in the investment policy statement. One common benchmark is the T-bill rate plus some sort of performance benchmark, for example, the T-bill rate plus 4%. On portfolios that have low turnover to avoid capital gains taxes, performance against the market benchmark may not be appropriate. What investors are interested in is the protection and growth of their purchasing power. Measuring portfolio returns. A simple method of computing total returns is to divide the portfolio's total earnings by the amount invested in the portfolio. Total earnings consist of income plus capital gains or losses. In other words, total earnings consist of the increase or decrease in the market value of the portfolio and are calculated using the following formula, which is the increase in market value divided by the beginning value times 100. Here's an example. In the course of a particular year, a portfolio's market value was 106,000 on January 1st and 110,000 on December 31st. On this basis, the return for the portfolio for the year was 3.77%, calculated using the total return formula pre-tax as follows. 110,000 minus 106,000 equals 4,000. Divide this by the beginning value of 106,000 times 100, and this is 3.77%. The total return formula shown above assumes no contributions to or withdrawals from the portfolio by the client. When cash flows in or out of the portfolio, a portion of the change in the value of the portfolio is the result of the cash flows themselves. Here's an example. In the course of a particular year, a portfolio's market value was $100,000 on January 1st and $150,000 on December 31st. The client added $15,000 in cash to the portfolio during the year. Therefore, 15,000 of the 50,000 increase in the value of the portfolio is due to the client contribution, not return on the investment. The return on a portfolio is affected by both the amount and timing of portfolio cash flows. There are several ways to deal with cash flows, and different portfolio reporting systems use different methods. Although a thorough discussion of these methods is not within the scope of this course, they are explained fully in two other Canadian Securities Institute courses, Investment Management Techniques and Wealth Management Essentials. Calculating the Risk-Adjusted Rate of Return Simply comparing the returns of two portfolios to measure performance does not provide an adequate assessment. You must also factor in the risk assumed to earn those returns. A risk-adjusted rate of return is a measure of how much risk is involved to produce a return. Risk-adjusted measures can be applied to individual securities as well as to portfolios. The Sharpe Ratio, a risk-adjusted measure shown in figure 16.4 below, is used by mutual fund companies and portfolio managers to compare the excess return of the portfolio to the portfolio's standard deviation, thereby taking the portfolio's risk into account. The Sharp Ratio is calculated as follows. The return of the portfolio subtract the risk-free rate 
which is typically the average of the three-month T-bill rate over the period being measured, and then you divide this by the standard deviation of the portfolio. If a portfolio is being measured against a benchmark, its sharp ratio can be compared to the sharp ratio of the applicable benchmark. The larger the sharp ratio, the better the portfolio's performance. A group of portfolios can therefore be ranked by their risk-adjusted performance. If a portfolio has a sharp ratio greater than the sharp ratio of the benchmark, that portfolio's manager has outperformed the benchmark. A portfolio's sharp ratio that is smaller than the benchmarks, this signals underperformance. A negative sharp ratio means that the portfolio's manager earned a return less than the risk-free return. Here's an example. A Canadian equity fund called DEF had an average fund return of 6% and a standard deviation of 5%. The Canadian equity benchmark had an average fund return of 8% and a standard deviation of 10%. The average risk-free return was 1%. For this example, the sharp ratio of the fund and its benchmark are calculated as shown below. The sharp ratio for the DEF fund is 6 subtract 1 divided by 5, and this equals 1. The sharp ratio for the benchmark is 8 subtract 1 divided by 10, and this equals 0 0.7. Both the fund and the benchmark had a positive sharp ratio, which means that they both had an average return greater than the average risk-free return. However, the DEF risk-adjusted return was higher than the benchmark's risk-adjusted return. That means the DEF was able to earn a greater return for each unit of risk compared to the benchmark. Even though the benchmark produced a higher total return, the benchmark employed twice as much risk to do so. Other factors in performance measurement. Dissimilarities in portfolios also make it difficult to get an accurate performance comparison. Each portfolio may have different risk characteristics or special investor constraints or objectives. When you find that dissimilarities are affecting portfolio returns, you should adjust the conclusions you draw from comparing their performance to accurately reflect the impact of the variables. The large number of variables in the management and measurement of portfolios make it difficult to assess investment performance. Regardless, in comparing performance, you should be concerned primarily with longer-term results. Those results best measure your management ability in all phases of the business cycle. It is also important to have consistent results and performance trends over several previous measurement periods. The last step, step seven, rebalance the portfolio. Rebalancing is the final step in the investment management process. This step is closely related to monitoring and performance evaluation. As financial markets and values evolve, their relative weights within client portfolios change. Severe market swings can result in the actual weight of an asset class in the portfolio becoming significantly different from the strategic weight established to meet the client's long-term goals. Rebalancing is the process of reallocating assets back to their originally intended portfolio weights by selling securities that have performed well and buying others that have done poorly. The rebalancing process is more or less a repeat of the dynamic asset allocation process noted in step three. During rebalancing, Keep in mind the method of developing a strategic asset mix and the dynamic and tactical approaches to asset allocation. Here's our summary for chapter 16. In this chapter, we discuss the following key aspects of the portfolio management process. Managing a portfolio of investments is a cyclical seven step process. As part of the first step, you must determine what rate of return your client needs to attain their goals and what risk they are willing and able to take to achieve those goals. In general, investors have three primary investment objectives, safety of principle, income, and growth of capital. Investment constraints are limitations that could prevent a client from taking full advantage of particular investments. The second step is to create an investment policy statement containing the rules, guidelines, investment objectives, and asset mix agreed on by you and your client. The third step is to formulate an asset mix. The basic asset classes are cash, fixed income securities, and equities. Asset class timing is the practice of switching among industries and asset classes with a goal of maximizing returns and minimizing losses. In making these decisions, you must observe the stages of the economic cycle, which are directly linked to equity cycles. Tactical asset allocation refers to short-term deviations from the strategic mix to capitalize on investment opportunities. Dynamic asset allocation refers to adjusting the asset mix to systematically rebalance the portfolio back to its long-term strategic asset mix. The fourth step is to select specific securities for inclusion in a client's portfolio. The fifth step is to monitor the client, the markets, and the economy. The manager makes decisions in light of changes in the investor's goals, financial position, and preferences relative to changing expectations for capital markets and individual securities and shifts in the economy as a whole. 
The sixth step is to evaluate performance. Success is measured by the total rate of return of the portfolio in comparison to the average total return of comparable portfolios. A portfolio manager's results are often measured against a predetermined benchmark specified in the investment policy statement. A simple method of computing total return is to divide the portfolio's total earnings by the amount invested in the portfolio. The Sharp Ratio measures the portfolio's risk-adjusted rate of return using standard deviation as the measure of risk. Finally, you must rebalance the portfolio by reallocating assets back to their originally intended portfolio weights. In other words, sell the securities that have performed well and buy others that have done poorly. Key Terms and Definitions Found in Chapter 16 The Portfolio Management Process Asset Allocation Apportioning investment funds among different categories of assets such as cash, fixed income securities, and equities. The allocation of assets is built around an investor's risk tolerance. Investment Policy Statement The agreement between a portfolio manager and a client that provides the guidelines for the manager. Strategic Asset Allocation An asset allocation strategy that rebalances investment portfolios regularly to maintain a consistent long-term mix. Dynamic Asset Allocation An asset allocation strategy that refers to the systematic rebalancing, either by time period or by weight, of the securities in the portfolio so that they match the long-term benchmark asset mix among the various asset classes. Tactical Asset Allocation An asset allocation strategy that involves adjusting a portfolio to take advantage of perceived inefficiencies in the prices of securities in different asset classes or within sectors. Benchmark, a standard against which an investment or portfolio is measured. A common benchmark is the T-bill rate plus some sort of performance benchmark, for example, the T-bill rate plus 4%. A benchmark could also be a market index, for example, the S&P TSX Composite Index. Risk-adjusted rate of return, a measure of how much risk is involved to produce a return. Risk-adjusted measures can be applied to individual securities as well as to portfolios. Sharp Ratio – a ratio measure of the portfolio's risk-adjusted rate of return using standard deviation as the measure of risk.